Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the August 2022 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of the European War and International Socialism by Lenin from 1914. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this piece was written in late August to September 1914, first published on August 1st, 1929 in Pravda number 174, published according to the manuscript. The source is Lenin Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1974, Moscow, Volume 21. HTML transcription and markup by D. Walters and R. Simbala, and it's in the public domain at the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive, marxists.org. Thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this file and thousands of other free Marxist texts. Let's get into it. To the socialist, it is not the horrors of war that are the hardest to endure. We are always for a holy war of all the oppressed, for the conquest of their own fatherland, as the saying goes. But the horrors of the treachery shown by the leaders of present-day socialism, the horrors of the collapse of the present-day international. Is it not treachery to socialism when we see the German socialists' amazing change of front after Germany's declaration of war? The false phrases about a war of liberation against czarism, forgetfulness of German imperialism, forgetfulness of the rape of Serbia, the bourgeois interests involved in the war against Britain, etc., etc., Chauvinist patriots vote for the war budget. Have the socialists of France and Belgium not shown the same kind of treachery? They're excellent at exposing German imperialism, but unfortunately they're amazingly purblind with regard to British, French, and particularly the barbarous Russian imperialism. They fail to see the disgraceful fact that, for decades on end, the French bourgeoisie have been paying out thousands of millions for the hire of the Black Hundred reactionary gangs of Russian czarism, and that the latter has been crushing the non-Russian majority in our country, robbing Poland, oppressing the great Russian workers and peasants, and so on. At such a time, the socialist feels refreshed when he reads of the bitter truth so courageously and straightforwardly told by Avanti to Sudicum, the truth that paper told the German socialists, namely that they are imperialists, i.e. chauvinists. One feels even more refreshed on reading the article by Zabordi, exposing not only the German and the Austrian brands of chauvinism, which is to the advantage of the Italian bourgeoisie, but also the French, an article which shows that this war is a war of the bourgeoisie of all lands. Avanti's stand, and the Zabordi article, as well as the resolution of the group of revolutionary Marxists at a recent conference in a Scandinavian country, shows us what is right and what is wrong in the usual phrase about the collapse of the international. This phrase is reiterated with malicious relish by the bourgeois and the opportunists, the reformisti di destra, reformists of the right, and with bitterness by socialists, Volksrecht and Zorik, and Bremer Burger Zeitung, two socialist dailies. There is a great deal of truth in the phrase, the downfall of the leaders and of most of the parties in the present-day international the second international, is a fact. Compare Vorwärts, Wiener Arbeiterzeitung, and Hamburger Echo versus L'Humanité, and the appeals of the Belgian and the French socialists versus the, quote, reply of the German Vorstand. The masses have not yet spoken out. Quick comment here, there are a number of footnotes about each of these papers and sort of what their political trajectory was within the socialist movement. I encourage you to click the link in the video description to the text, and then read through those if you're not familiar with them. Continuing. However, Zipporti is a thousand times right in saying that it is not a matter of theory being wrong, or of the remedy of socialism being wrong, but simply of its not being available in sufficient doses, and of certain socialists not being sufficiently socialist. In other words, socialist theory is correct, but people are not following through. It is not socialism that has collapsed in the shape of the present-day European international, but an insufficient socialism, i.e. opportunism and reformism. It is this, quote, tendency, which exists everywhere in all countries, and has found such vivid expression in Bisolati and company in Italy, that has collapsed, for it has for years been teaching forgetfulness of the class struggle, etc., etc., from the resolution. 
Lenin is here referring to the resolution adopted by the Bolshevik group at its meeting in Bern, August 24-26, 1914. Zabordi is right when he sees the European socialists' main guilt in their attempts to backdate their justification with plausible excuses, both of their inability to prevent the carnage and their need to take part in the latter. They prefer to create the semblance of doing voluntarily, European socialism, what they are forced to do of necessity, that the socialists have lined up with their own particular nation, with the latter's bourgeois government, in a measure capable of engendering disappointment in us, also in all socialists who are not opportunists, and delight all non-socialists in Italy, and of course not of Italy alone, but of all countries, for example, Russian liberalism. Even given the total incapacity and impotence of the European socialists, the behavior of their leaders reveals treachery and baseness. The workers have been driven into the slaughter, while the leaders vote in favor and join governments. Even with their total impotence, they should have voted against, should not have joined their governments and uttered chauvinistic infamies, should not have shown solidarity with their, quote, nation, and should not have defended their, quote, own bourgeoisie. They should have unmasked its vileness. Everywhere there is the bourgeoisie and the imperialists. Everywhere the ignoble preparations for carnage. If Russian czarism is particularly infamous and barbarous, and more reactionary than all the rest, then German imperialism, too, is monarchist. Its aims are feudal and dynastic, and its gross bourgeoisie are less free than the French. The Russian Marxists were right in saying that, to them, the defeat of czarism was the lesser evil for their immediate enemy was, first and foremost, great Russian chauvinism, but that in each country the socialists, who are not opportunists, ought to see their main enemy in their own, quote-unquote, homemade chauvinism. Is it true, however, that the incapacity is so very absolute? Is that so? Shot down, held in tot, and a miserable death? And all this for the sake of another country? Not always. The initiative was possible, and even obligatory. Illegal propaganda and civil war would be more honest and obligatory for socialists. This is what the Russian socialists are calling for. For instance, they take comfort in the illusion that the war will end and things will settle down. But no, for the collapse of the present day, 1889-19 to International, not to turn into the collapse of socialism, for the masses not to turn away, and to prevent the domination of anarchism and syndicalism, just as shamefully as in France, the truth must be looked in the face. Whoever wins, Europe is threatened by the growth of chauvinism, by revenge-seeking, etc. Militarism, whether German or Great Russian, fosters counter-chauvinism, and the like. It is our duty to draw the conclusion of the complete collapse of the opportunism, the reformism, so impressively proclaimed in Italy, and so decisively rejected, by the Italian comrades. So the manuscript breaks off here. That's not probably supposed to be the end of the text, but it is the actual end of the text. However, there's a footnote and some marginal notes. Ever since its foundation in 1892, a sharp ideological struggle was conducted in the Italian Socialist Party between the opportunist and the revolutionary wings, which differed on the question of the party's policy and tactics. Under pressure from the lefts, the most outspoken reformists, Bonomi and Bisalati, who supported the war and advocated collaboration with the government and the bourgeoisie, were expelled from the party at its congress in Reggio Emilia in 1982. After the outbreak of the war, of course World War I, in case you're really lost, and before Italy's entry into it, the party took an anti-war stand under the slogan, Against the War for Neutrality. In December 1914, the party expelled a group of renegades, Mussolini and others, who defended the imperialist policy of the bourgeoisie and favored Italy's participation in the war. Comment there, Mussolini, less than three years later, in 1917, would be hired by the British intelligence service MI5 and paid a salary to begin his uh, new direction, shall we say. Continuing, the Italian socialists met in a joint conference with the Swiss socialists at Lugano, 1914, and took an active part in the International Socialist Conferences in Simmerwald, 1915, and Quintal, 1916. On the whole, however, the Italian Socialist Party followed a centrist policy. With Italy's entry into the war in May 1915, the party renounced its anti-war stand 
and issued a slogan, neither participate in the war nor sabotage it, which in practice meant support for the war. So as far as the marginal notes, Lenin had written that the contemptuous and scornful attitude of De Neuzeit toward the Italian socialists and Avanti amounted to petty concessions to opportunism, the golden mean. Finally, the so-called center equal the lackeys of the opportunists. So, uh, that's the end of the text. Lenin wrote a lot about World War I and the collapse of the Second International due to opportunism, specifically opportunism that came to a head in the endorsing of the bourgeois imperialist war, World War I. Prior to the war, the various socialist parties that were participating in the international had basically agreed that should war break out, which was looking more and more likely, that they would tell their membership and the working class of Europe generally not to support the war, but to turn the war between the bourgeoisie into war against the bourgeoisie. In other words, when the bourgeoisie and the capitalist governments of Europe tell you, the working class, hey, pick up a gun and go shoot at some worker from another country for us so that we can solidify our system and hammer out our inner capitalist squabbles. Don't do it. Don't shoot at other workers, but instead, realize your collective strength, turn on the bourgeoisie, shut the whole thing down, and have a revolution. Catch them when their pants are down. During this vulnerable time of crisis for all the bourgeoisies of Europe, hit them. Strike. What are you waiting for? That's the perfect opportunity. You get what you want and what you've been organizing for, and you avoid doing the horrific thing that they're instructing you to do. Why would you endorse that? Well, a lot of the parties involved in the Socialist International did that. Lenin was furious. Wrote a lot about it, especially against Karl Kautsky, who was kind of the ringleader of a lot of this. If you look at works like The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky, The Collapse of the Second International, opportunism and the collapse of the Second International, and many other works, Lenin wrote about this extensively. Marxism-Leninism could not be clearer when it comes to the working class not supporting imperialist war. That is, war of capitalists in the era of highly advanced capitalism. Sometimes inexperienced Marxists attempt to do analysis and get confused, for example, by the history of China, where the Chinese Communist Party allied with the Kuomintang, the bourgeois nationalist faction, in the early 20th century after the Qing dynasty collapsed. So in the decades just after Chinese feudalism collapsed, Chinese capitalism was not highly developed. It was not imperialism at that time. In fact, they were fending off Japanese imperialism. So the Chinese bourgeoisie, Chinese capitalism generally, was not well developed. It had not advanced to the stage of monopoly capitalism. It was still in the early stages where the bourgeoisie, as Lenin writes in other places, is still fighting alongside the working classes. In that sense, in early capitalism, as feudalism is being overthrown and the bourgeois nation state is being developed and set up, then capitalism is fulfilling its progressive role in historical development. And socialists share many of the same interests. The problem is, once the capitalists do attain power, sort of get the nation state set up and get their class exploitation, capitalism, rolling along, then their whole existence and wealth depends on the exploitation of the working class, and all this sort of freedom fighting comes to a halt. The talk of equality and freedom was good for them when they were setting up the nation, but eh, eh, don't go too far, or else the bourgeoisie is going to get overthrown. That's what they realize. And then at that point, the class-conscious proletariat, you know, capitalism has fulfilled its purpose at this point, needs to organize and turn against the bourgeoisie. So the stage of historical development in terms of feudalism to capitalism to socialism, and even which stage of capitalism, the rising stage or the imperialist stage, that matters in doing this analysis. It really matters. So where are we in 2022? Are we still in the rising stage of capitalism in Europe and Russia, etc.? No, we are not. That has been left long behind. In fact, Russia used to be in a higher stage of development, used to be the premier socialist federation on earth, 
And unfortunately, it succumbed to counter-revolution, and it went backwards a few steps back into capitalism. That's where it is now. The current leadership of Russia has designs on basically recreating the Tsarist Empire. It is extremely counter-revolutionary and is imperialist. It is not the, uh, you know, sort of Wild West, just setting up capitalism, ascendant nation-state uh, type of situation. Again, it went through all that, went on even into socialism, <laughs> was approaching communism and reverted back into highly organized, advanced imperial capitalism, because that is the highest stage of capitalism. That's what it is, imperialism. So it's only been at that in the case of Russia for about 30 years. So to compare it to something like the United States and its EU allies, Russia has, you know, comparatively much less blood on its hands, largely just as a consequence of time. Because I say 30 years, it's been a little bit over 30 years since the destruction of the USSR. But Russia, I mean, the former USSR, was in chaos for most of the 90s. So really, it's kind of only been at this for about 20 years. It's still a baby in that sense. It's a baby imperialist power. But make no mistake, there is not some other mode of production that they're following. It's capitalism. It's advanced capitalism, imperialism. So... As of March 2022, per a YouGov poll, in the United States, a majority of the population, 57%, still thinks that Russia is socialist or communist. Only about 10 or 11% identify it as capitalist. That is how screwed up people are on the state of things in the world, and nobody knows anything. So as we hurtle towards possibly World War III, which, you know, as far as a, quote, multipolar capitalist world, that's really what you get. Either the capitalists work out their disputes peacefully, or they have giant wars. And uh, giant wars is probably the likely outcome. Well, in this world, it's incumbent on Marxists to straighten people out in terms of their understanding. Yes, we're up against the bourgeois media putting out their messaging. We're up against all kinds of bizarre opportunists putting out their messaging. But we have to be clear in our program of educating the working class from a Marxist-Leninist standpoint, especially looking back at what was such a pivotal event, World War I, the collapse of the Second International, which led to the establishment of the Third Communist International, or the Comintern. Second International was so corrupt and broken, basically the successful socialists just scrapped it, moved on, made a Third International. And uh, the Third International was unfortunately disbanded in World War II. And today we find ourselves again, the socialist movement largely having fallen into revisionism and facing massive global capitalist crisis. I believe that Marxism-Leninism can deliver us from this situation, can point us in the direction of a way out, but it's going to take a lot of building. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialismforall. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful and have allowed me to spend a lot more time creating content for this channel than I would have been able to do otherwise. Then after the content is created, engagement counts, so like, share, subscribe, comment, all of that stuff helps YouTube to recommend this content to additional people and keep the audience growing. We've been seeing that growth, and again, we really need it. This is a serious time of crisis for capitalism, and the U.S. left, where I am, really could stand some improvement. Baseline education, we're here to help with that. Thanks again, and we'll catch you in the next video.